Welcome to Building Better Worlds. Our mission here is simple, to explore how the innovations of Web3 can be utilized to sustain the natural world. Today, we hear from two pioneers in the regenerative crypto space. Join us as we learn how to navigate through and build our better worlds. I'm your host, Mutz, and today I have two gentlemen that I'm uh, excited to talk to, and I'll have them introduce themselves, if you don't mind. Uh, hey, Mutz, um, I'm Simon, originally from Belgium, been in Singapore for seven years, and I am one of three founders of Handprint, a company that is building the sustainability architecture for Web2 and Web3. Awesome. Well said. That is wonderful, right? <laughs> Yeah, right. That sounds great. Um, yeah, I know. Hey, Moots, I'm Ryan, uh, Ryan Merrill. I'm the chief impact officer at Handprint and, and also one of the co-founders. Okay. All right. Awesome. So, uh, um, Ryan, and let me start with you. Uh, I'll do this quick for everybody because it's a little bit of our history. So right. about four or five years ago, it's been a while, Simon and I started a nonprofit organization called the Global Mangrove Trust. Yes. As an NGO here in Singapore, building fintech solutions for community-based mangrove reforestation and conservation projects right. in Southeast Asia and around the world. Right. That, that work evolved very quickly uh -huh. into two big efforts that we'd love to talk about a little bit today. Okay. The first one is the work at GMT, at Global Mangrove Trust, where we've been working to build space-based crediting for blue carbon impact assessment. We are building a new system for developing carbon credits for mangroves from space using machine learning and artificial intelligence. That work evolved very quickly into what we're really excited to tell you guys about today, which is our social enterprise, which we founded in. End of 2019. Thank you. Uh, right. Handprint, which okay. took the best ideas from Global Mangrove Trust and folded them into a social enterprise here in Singapore. Okay, so if I can just take you back to the mangrove, then we'll go to Handprint, right? So mangrove, why mangrove? I know I learned a little bit about the mangrove, but why mangrove? Both of our companies, Global Mangrove Trust and Handprint, direct funds into mangrove reforestation and mangrove conservation efforts because mangroves represent probably the most effective natural technology for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and fighting global warming. Mangroves okay. sequester between four and 10 times the carbon at an increased speed. So it's faster and it's more than terrestrial forests, including okay. tropical forests. Oh, really? And mangroves I'll tell you one more thing because it's really important that mangroves not just serve as green lungs for the planet, storing and capturing carbon and storing it in their soils and roots, but they also serve as green shields to protect some of the most vulnerable populations on earth all along the tropical belts of our planet from the rising seas and the storm surges and king tides that represent the environmental threats for mm -hmm. coastal communities in the 21st century. Right. And so uh, if the little that I saw, mangroves grow around coasts, usually around coastal continents. Is, yeah. is that the only region or could they grow inward, inland, inland, sorry? I mean, they definitely can grow quite far inland, but they typically start at the coast. So much of our work is around uh, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia, where you have, I don't know, 10,000, maybe more islands. So there are loads of these small islands that are, literally protected by mangroves. And when the mangroves disappear, what we see happening is that the islands start sinking. Not only is the sea rising, which is a consequence of global warming, but the disappearing right. of the mangroves causes soil erosion that basically uh, reduces the height of the island over time. So it's incredibly important to protect those natural ecosystems um, because it just uh, it's a matter of life and death for many people in Southeast Asia that are directly affected by the existence of mangroves. Back in 2008, there was a big cyclone in the Bay of Bengal that killed right. 138,000 people uh, yes. in Myanmar. And um, research has shown that the areas where mangroves had been cut were very, very badly affected and loads of people died. But the small patches of land where the mangroves had been sustained 
the, the communities that were living there uh, largely survived that uh, cyclone. So that was a very clear uh, point of evidence to suggest that this is an incredibly important uh, pr protection against uh, the adverse effect of climate change. And so when we look at this from a, like a valuation perspective, there's quite some research that suggests that one hectare of mangroves, um, just in terms of insurance value, is worth about 180,000 US dollars. And it costs about $3,000 to plant and protect for five, six years. So from that perspective, it's an insanely good investment. And then it also absorbs carbon, protects biodiversity, provides natural habitat for crabs and fish species. I think about 10% of aquatic life is born in mangroves and lives there. So it's one of our most valuable natural capital assets that we have. And especially in Southeast Asia, it's fast disappearing. So protecting it is, uh, yeah, incredible. So important. it is, you're from Belgium, is that right, Simon? That's correct. And you're we from- We don't have mangroves. You don't have mangroves, and you're from the United States or London? That's right, Virginia, in the United States. Virginia. So, how how did you guys intersect into mangroves? How does mangroves play into your picture? For you know, how does it get your attention? If so, you don't yeah, sure. So, I mean, it all started um, back in 2016. I was a fresh professor, an assistant professor of strategy at Singapore Management University, and I. My, my research interest for a long time was in sustainability and the protection of the natural world. And right. I got a grant to uh, study innovation in the natural world in Southeast Asia. So a grant from the university. And as part of that grant, I went to a conference in the US where I ran into Ryan and I'd been interviewing loads of people to come work on this <laughs> grant with me, but nobody really fit the bill. And then we had a couple of glasses of wine and I offered him, or maybe one glass. He'll, he won, I had more. And then <laughs> I pretty much instantly offered offered him the job. And I'll let him continue the story then. <laughs> Which was probably the best job a postdoc can hope for. I uh, got the opportunity to run around Southeast Asia for the better part of two years researching all the most cutting edge instances of using platform architectures okay. to uh, innovate and scale um, uh, technology applications and sustainable resource management uh, solutions. So uh, that was that was great. We got to, to work with uh, Ant Forest in Hangzhou and the fishery in Indonesia and a variety of really, really interesting entrepreneurs using Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 technologies to drive impactful regenerative change on the ground. Of those cases, by far the most inspiring was the work that we uh, developed in researching uh, Lika and the Thor Heyerdahl Climate Park in Myanmar, where, okay. which is probably, I think, either the, the most successful or second most successful mangrove regeneration uh, project on Earth, uh, led by Arne Flortov, and their efforts to use blockchain technologies and tokenization to raise funds for large-scale mangrove regeneration at a time when it was simply almost impossible to right. derive financial flows and sustainable financial flows from groups like um, the United Nations and the more traditional development ecosystem. So right. it's a perfect example of the ch challenges of funding mangrove work and the opportunities of digital technologies and digital finance to yeah. create novel funding flows that could be relied on, that could be fast, and that could be large in scale. Nice, all right. so. Now we have Global Man Mangrove Trust. How does it transition into Handprint, which you are more excited about? <laughs> well, well, I mean, Handprint is, is, I think, more exciting because the GMT, right. as we like to call it, is basically, it's a small ecosystem coordinator. Uh, there's four people working on it and we're doing really interesting stuff there, but Handprint now has 25 people. We just closed a uh, seed round led by uh, Tunes, a strategic investor, a fintech investor. And, um, and yeah, so this is really interesting now. And so basically what happened was that um, somewhere in, I think, September 2019, we started working with a friend of mine, a seasoned entrepreneur and engineer, um, on a grant proposal to, um, to actually 
get a get grant money from the Singaporean government and from the French government to develop a blockchain architecture together with a French blockchain uh, company uh -huh. to facilitate and create transparency for uh, funding flows to mangrove restoration projects. Okay. And we start working with this, this friend of mine called Matthias. And while that grant proposal eventually was written and has been kind of laying around collecting dust for over two years, <laughs> we realized that the collaboration with Matthias itself was actually very fruitful and we really liked working together. And I think two months into that collaboration, we decided we're going to set up a company and actually bring some of those ideas we developed in Global Mangrove Trust into a social enterprise that will allow us to scale much faster and actually okay. access risk capital. And, um, and then also potentially diversify some of the work we've been doing to create more meaningful impact. Our goal was always to be impact driven, to be mission driven and to solve real problems that exist in the world in the impact space. Um, and so that crosses kind of the NGO space, the development aid space, as well as corporate philanthropy and, and carbon crediting, like everything that tries to do good stuff for the world. But they all are facing the same problems. And there are no real, at least when we started, there were no real easily easy solutions that do two things well. One is provide credibility that when you're sending money or when you're doing something good, yeah, you're doing kind of a donation, you're sponsoring a project that you need credibility that this project is really happening, that right. you are supporting it. You can right. own that claim. It, that's yeah. legitimate. And that that project over time is going to keep creating impact. You don't want to just do a one-off and then oh yeah, we plant right. a tree and then one month later, the tree disappears. So right. solving that is already very complex. But then... Okay. The key challenge on top of that is how do you make it valuable for companies to actually do that? Because we can go to a company, any company, and say, you should spend a million dollars planting mangroves because it's really important for the world. <laughs> and they will tell us, fuck right. off, we have a business to run. Exactly. And so what we figured out over time, this wasn't like a one-day uh, <laughs> one workshop. But so again, if this has been our learning for the last couple of years, All is right. that you can create a lot of value if you integrate very tiny donations, very tiny sponsorship costs, let's say for companies. But if you embed those into their transaction architecture, okay. you change the way the company is perceived by the people and companies with whom it is transacting. So if you can embed a 1% or a 5 cent donation into your digital checkout process as an e-commerce store, then the person that clicks on buy has the feeling that if I do this, I know 5, 1% of that budget or 5 cent or 10 cent is going to go to this regenerative project or a tree yes. will be planted. Or, yes. And that's powerful. Because it, so it changes the, the narrative. It changes the way you engage with your stakeholders. And so we've been doing this now uh, with, in a variety of industries, with banking, with digital advertising, in retail, uh, in sports brands, uh, in, with alcohol brands. And so what we're trying to do is embed positive impact in the moment of transaction. And by doing that, it goes from a cost that exists in the philanthropy department and that basically only results in some kind of uh, sustainability report that nobody ever reads to something that exists front and center is run by the marketing department and that directly speaks to your key stakeholders, be that your employees, your, uh, your, uh, your customers, or potentially your suppliers. And that changes the, the value question because suddenly you create value. That's, that's, that's a lot to give you guys in <laughs> one sound, that's, it's in one sound bite. And, and I would, I would even add more because it's the, 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 what's beautiful about it for me and why I, I remain super in, excited about the work is that what Simon has just described is a really, really critical first step. And yes. yet it's obviously not unique. We see Roundup programs, we see oh, micro oh, yeah. programs all across the economy. What we've learned is incredibly valuable and what guides a lot of our product development and uh, our own road mapping is closing the loop. And bringing that experience around after that first connection between the stakeholder or the customer and the leading brand 
uh, or company and bringing it back to them a week later, a month later, and so that they can follow that impact and they can become a co-participant and a co-claimant to that impact over time. So it's, nice. it's closing the loop and bringing that experience back to the, to the customer, the buyer, the subscriber, the employee, and, and making that enduring, which is what is so powerful about using public ledgers is because as those claims become immutable and they become shareable, and they become conditional. So we can create challenge games around it, gifting games around it. We can create interactions. We can start to create virtuous viral growth. And the customers can start to co-regenerate the planet together with their favorite brands and then take that experience and begin to seed a growing experience that continues together with their families and their friends. Mm. I, I like that because all, like you said, you're closing the gap because, you know, like I go to a checkout, let's say Dick's Sporting Goods. I'm not knocking Dick's Sporting Goods. I check out, they tell me donate to this cause. I mm. click 1%. I really don't know if it's going to get there. I really don't. It could end up in their pockets, right? Yeah. And I think this I'm, is I'm, I'm not just speaking this company. It could, right? In my mind. And a part of it does and probably maybe part of it does but probably it doesn't and it's the same way when you're booking a flight and then the airline gives you the option hey do you want to pay five dollars extra to uh offset your carbon emissions which basically right. means donate money to the airline right and i know exactly. delta is in trouble but so this is not a way that you can really create engagement and so what is important is that if a company enables this they say if you're doing this you become the owner and the owner doesn't, and if you want to be the owner, that's great. But that doesn't mean we're going to send you a PDF uh, that says you've planted five trees because right. that's not really portable and that's not really right. tangible. But if right. we can tokenize that impact and it basically, we create like, an, like a digital wallet where you can have all kinds of impact tokens that says, okay, over the last years through my purchasing via all kinds of means, I have uh, financed 500 trees, uh, 200 corals, I've supported the building of a school, and I have tangible proof of that in the metaverse. Yes. yes. That becomes useful because that becomes also something that can, that it can inspire loyalty programs that can give you access to the yes. variety of events. So this is- Because I want to know that my giving is, has like, I want to at least have a visual or some kind of sense that my giving did something. If yeah. right now, everything that we have is just saying I'm giving, but I'd never know, right? Exactly. But what you're saying is that I give, I purchase, I do whatever. I'm going to have a, some kind of reports somewhere in the digital space that this yep. is what my contribution did. And you're that is- You're going to have a handprint. You're going right. to have a handprint. There it is. Some of your in, in saving the, the universe and the world. <laughs> I love That's it. it. That's it. And so- how did this team of 25 guys come together, if you don't mind? There's lots of women. Don't say guys. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Guys is gender neutral for me, but yeah, yeah. guys and girls and whoever. How did you guys come together? How did you recruit? Uh, we, we got really lucky uh because uh and, I, and then there are three of us matisse isn't here present but but we did start with a great founding team we got two phds and an engineer so you've got a lot of a lot of ideas maybe a lot of bad ideas but but a but a strong a strong bent for uh science-based decision making and experimentation uh, one of the real pleasures of working with matthias we, we set out in the first year just to make a fast prototyping company so we, we've got a mission we've got a vision but we we need to learn to fast prototype so I, I mean, that was mostly what we wanted to accomplish in our first year. Let's oh. figure out how to fast prototype well. Uh, and then we got really lucky to recruit some very smart women very early. So, so our general manager, Mimi, our head of product, Celeste, um, joining us right in the beginning made an enormous difference. So our, our, our core team and, and Mark, our, our head of design, was just, uh, mm. again, I, I think there's something fundamental about doing technical work or technology work and sustainability and maybe i like to think some of it may be cutting edge you you get really really great people self-selecting into your team and yes. so far i think we've benefited in a year where where labor pools are disrupted to say the least um by an opportunity to interact with some really 
very impassioned, hardworking, intelligent, energetic people who are driven by a sense of spirit and, um, and service and altruism um, and quite, quite sharp. So I'd say all together, the biggest strength that I've seen is, is a great team. Uh, mm -hmm. Great people coming to us and, and bringing us their enthusiasm and a pretty great idea set, a wonderful canvas for putting that energy into practice. Awesome. So rumor has it that you were able to raise about $2 million in the last few days. Is that right? <laughs> I mean, last few days is, 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 is how that is perceived by the outside world. But um, we, I think we signed our, our term sheet on the 28th of November, and it's taken until the end of uh, uh, almost the end of March to get, get from that initial 16 page document to what, whatever it is now. Uh, it feels like 500 pages of uh, of contracts, but yeah, we got we got there in the end, and uh, it's been I mean it's been a painful uh, but useful learning process, and right. I think it's it really sets us up very well for for growth. We have a very strategic investor. Uh, we had a meeting two days ago uh, with about seven eight people in their team about integrating parts of their technology, them integrating parts of our technology, productizing this. And so there's a lot of uh, synergy that we're exploring, which is why we really wanted to work with them. And so, yeah, it's, it's been a long journey, but uh, in the last two days in these, I think we announced it on, on Friday. Um, and yeah, so now we are yeah, excited and ready to go. All right, awesome. so with this investment on board with this team that's coming in that you're integrating, how, what's the trajectory? What, how do you see yourselves expanding or expanding your reach or your impact or whatever you're doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think it's ultimately you're trying to solve a, a problem for providing fantastic service to a global economy. If you want right. to regenerate, if you want to make the entire global economy regenerative, you want to build high scaling protocols and processes that can enable impactful regenerative action for anybody anywhere. Right. In reality, uh, a lot of corporate leadership have a deep connection to their own geographies, their own uh, customer bases. So, so there is a natural inclination to lead from the impact side. Uh, right. our, our impact partners uh, were primarily almost everybody in, in Southeast Asia initially. And so that really shaped the, the type of companies that we found ourselves having a lot of traction with. Um, both Southeast Asian firms and European firms uh, working in Southeast Asia and wanting to enter into the Southeast Asian market. Right now, uh, our, our natural extension, because again, mangroves is what we understood first, then ocean yeah. regeneration, and then social regeneration is a little equatorial. So um, most of the work we're right, doing right now and expanding the impact portfolio and the teams we support on the ground is into Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, into uh, uh, Kenya, uh, Madagascar, Nigeria, and I think we'll probably end up naturally continuing um, mm. west uh, yeah. from there into Central America and, and, and Latin America uh, as sort of geographies where we think we can find fantastic partners on the ground and support their work. That allows you to communicate to big brands and MNCs who feel a resonance to doing impactful work in those regions. Yeah, I'll awesome. elaborate on that. Yeah, and I think in terms of kind of priorities, so what we're doing is we are we are partnering with a variety of organizations, uh, co corporations that are co-developing with us a new value proposition that they can sell to their corporate to their corporate clients. Yeah. So we're doing this in the banking space. We're doing this in advertising. We're doing this in media shortly. Uh, we're planning to do this potentially in the travel space. We're, we're in conversations. And so what's really exciting about this approach and, and if we can make it work is that as a still small but now fast growing organization, um, we have the capability to work with some of the biggest companies in the world that nobody knows exist. Um, and these companies can get incredible access to scale, right? So if we are building a regenerative credit card architecture with the company that sells credit card technology to 45% of the biggest banks in the world, then right. the scalability the scalability is, is massive because if they right. can start convincing uh, both neo banks and classic banks that, hey, there is, we have this new service, we have this new product, you can just buy into it and that's it. 
Um, right. It's much easier than us going out to whatever JP Morgan Chase and say, hey, do you want to work with handprint in Singapore? Anyway, right. They wouldn't open the door. Right. But if we right. have that that, uh, that partner, they will. And we have the same kind of relationships with uh, with uh, partners in media and in, uh, in advertising. So that's really exciting. So this is where we see a lot of our growth. And then we're working on a, a mobile app. Um, but we won't talk a lot about that. Um, but so the idea uh, is that it's going to change the world. That's good. That's about enough. That's, that's enough. Right? That's really great. That was perfect. <laughs> that's all you can give right now. That, that's all we can give right now. Yeah. All right. It, I'll, I'll change the world for the better. Yeah. That, that's I'll, I'll, wait that's for that one. I'll wait for the right time. So the yeah. thing I love about what you guys are doing is that you are making, and I'm, I might phrase it wrong, and forgive me if I do, but you're, you're making saving the world or saving the planet accessible and almost almost enjoyable yeah. if Definitely. you can call it that right in, in other words like i want to be part of this because it makes me want to be part of it it's not you're not selling me on the idea it's like you're just telling me about this cool thing and if i do this cool thing i'm saving the world part at least i'm doing my part and that's what i like about it i don't have to explain it too much i'm like just whatever you have to do. We save the world with building mangroves in, in sub-Saharan Africa, whatever we're doing. Yeah. And you don't, and you can put it on your Instagram, like, look what I did or whatever. And it's all accessible. It's fun. It's, and companies don't feel like they have to be sold with the idea. And I love that. And so you guys are doing great work. I got to ask a question. As I was doing my research, I had about 30 minutes before this interview. Are you guys associated with GrowCoin? Is that you guys? I'd say actually we designed it. So so yes, yeah, that was one of that was our one of our core prototypes. So uh, yes, yeah, the the grow coin is a concept is sat underneath a lot of the architecture that we're building, and it's a it's a stock and flow system. It's a stake coin uh, for um, uh, providing an immutable and yet transferable claim to regenerative Im impact. The grow coin is for a global uh, reforestation objective. And it was uh, you know, launched out of um, a supporting ecosystem uh, in the Global Policy Initiative Lab for Climate Finance in 2020. Um, that work has been a part and parcel to our uh, strategic development of uh, on-chain uh, universal proof of impacts. So, you know, a lot of our work is now looking at the, the intersection of the NFT opportunity set and uh, and the sort of the they call it Web 3.0 uh, opportunity set for uh, creating universal um, impact, impact tokens, tokens. yeah, you know, and, uh, and and then leveraging Hive wallets and smart contracts to make that again to make that experience of saving the world um, immutable and reliable, but also transferable and then ultimately social. So. So yeah, the grow coin was the sort of like a prototype so, one. Yeah, so I think simply, so the grow coin was something that we designed as an architecture on Zilliqa. And Zilliqa is a blockchain platform that came out of NUS from the universities here that's done really well and was like one of the first ones to adopt sharding and move quickly right. in this thing. And so I think it taught us a lot about um, critical challenges that are present in the space when you're trying to solve the... So the most fundamental problem in the impact space, which is how do we guarantee that the impact is real? How do we guarantee that it's not double sold, right? Because when you buy a product, you know you own the product because it's delivered to you. And yes. that's even the same with an NFT, right? You still get delivery, you get some kind of proof. But yes. when you buy impact like a tree, there is no tree delivery. And in theory, sure. in theory, they could sell the same tree to a hundred people and pocket yes. the money, right? Yes. So solving that double spend problem and double sell problem is essential in the impact space, which is why there is such a convergence uh, between impact and, uh, and the blockchain world. So what we are looking at doing now is kind of revamping that the architecture and the design of the grow coin uh, which were, which actually had multiple coins that were affiliated with that. There was not just a grow coin, there was a care, there was a variety of things. And so 
we're talking to a variety of the big players now and the big blockchain uh, architectures, uh, companies like Tezos, Algorand, um, Polygon. Uh, right. To see which of those is going to be the best strategic partner for us to okay. build our technology that we've currently built in a, in a centralized fashion on AWS. But we clearly have the vision to say that a lot of that needs to become um, basically, yeah, know that architecture needs to be reinvented right. and turned into a public ledger. Because what you want when you're doing something good mm -hmm. as a company, you want credibility. You want yeah. it to be public yes. and you want it to be auditable. Because yes. that, so as a consequence, there is a natural uh, connection by putting a lot of that information on the blockchain. So this is a, yeah, this is going to be a big part of our technology development in the next quarters is going from the conceptualization that we've been working on to the user stories, to the architecture, and then, uh, yeah, turning our, let's say, our in intestines as an organization, <laughs> turning yeah. those inside out by making right. that available on the public ledger. <laughs> just, just, right. I want to add to that, Moose, just a last thought, because the, the people we support on the ground do amazing work. Right. The teams, the teams in the field who are building schools and planting trees and restoring coral reefs and pulling plastic out of the sea and saving girls from some human trafficking conditions. These are these are shockingly cool organizations run by amazing people. Yes. And yet the the NGO space on the ground suffers this structural trust problem. And so yes. you know, when, when we're working with corporations and we're working with you know, sponsors globally, we're always trying to solve that problem. And in the solving of it, it's easy to, to overstate the magnitude of that problem because so many of the people on the ground are so honest and they're working so hard. Right. And, and they're spending so much of their resources just showing the world that they're honest. Yes. So, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that as we're solving this problem from the sponsor side of the market, we're also trying to solve and we are solving that problem for the impact side of the market for yes, nonprofits yes. on the ground who don't want to spend 40 percent of their administrative time on really preparing themselves. Right. Right. For the next report uh, and the next audit. And, and yes. you know, so so making that efficient and automated and peer-to-peer -peer is part and parcel to the effort that we're bringing to bear. Bringing that on chain, bringing that into a distributed environment has such promise to free those communities to spend less time in the office and more time in the field doing what they love and why they have elected to those careers in the first place. And no one goes into nonprofit management because they want to be an administrator. They go in because they want to make it. Want to do good work, and so it's you're solving a problem on both sides. Yeah. So if I can restructure what you just said, yeah. using this blockchain technology and what you're building is you're saying big company that you're going to sponsor, you're going to know that your money is being put to good use because we're going to, like you said, show I bring our intestines out and show you what we got. Yep. The little guy, not necessarily little, but the guy that's on the ground, that's doing the work, you don't have to fret and worry about all this stuff that you have to do to prove yourself to these guys because we're going to help you do that. And as long as we work with you, it creates that, that shake hand syndrome where I'm shaking your hand and I'm trusting you and we can yeah. do business together. Yeah. And I love that. You have, that. You have a great way with words. Really good. <laughs> We're going to take some parts of this and just use it as advertising for handprint on, uh, on YouTube, I think. Uh, hey, listen, take talking. it away. Uh, <laughs> but if you use it, you got to invite me to Singapore and take me out to some great restaurant. That's the only disclaimer I have. Deal. Don't requirement. Uh, guys, it's been great. Uh, it's been fun. Uh, I love what you're doing. Good luck in everything that you do. Uh, it's been awesome talking to you guys and hope to see your work somewhere soon. All right. Thanks, Moots. Cheers, Moots. Pleasure meeting you. Have Pleasure a good evening. And you too. Yeah, good luck with the podcast. All the best. Yeah. Bye. Bye.